and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, allow me to regale a tale as old as time, yet still in its prime, the tales of the good old days. The good old days where the sun and the moon and the stars and the spotlights all shined a little bit brighter. The good old days where the only forms of social media available were those good old fashioned rotary phones. The good old days where there were no such things as social distancing or the six feet apart rule. That is, unless you were deathly frightened of possibly contracting Polio. And of course, the good old days with soda fountains, jukebox dives, going steady, and the twist, along with some measure of proper etiquette, were the order of the day for the young and the young at heart. In other words, on the special extended edition of the Thrift Store Rundown, we're going to take you back in time to the golden eras of Hollywood the 1940s and the 1950s. And all along the way, we'll be providing you with a little something to stack on from those two eras, and even from the 60s, during this virtual world trip back in time. All of this by way of three books. First, Hollywood in the 1940s, The Star's Own Stories, edited by Ivy Craig Wilson with a foreword by entertainment columnist Liz Smith. This was purchased for $3.99. Next, Hollywood the Jaw. Entertainment journalist Betty Goodwin compiles lost recipes of legendary Hollywood haunts in this $2.49 set purchase. And finally, Life in the Fabulous 50s from Women's Magazine. Like Hollywood in the 1940s, this was purchased for $3.99. Unlike 1940s Hollywood, however, this was purchased for 25% off. So, Raise those curtains and make Ed Sullivan proud as Tia Sun prepares to book on a really big show on a really small budget. And what do you know, the show's about to begin. Let's get this grand old ball rolling with Hollywood in the 1940s, published in 1980 by Frederick Ungar Publishing Company, based in New York. So yes, we are talking about Hollywood in the 1940s, 40 years after the fact. Pretty neat. This retailed for $17.95, and it is worth noting that we will be reviewing all three books in a chronological order by year of their publication. Liz Smith and Ivy Crane Wilson start us off with a foreword and an introduction of the album. And the list of contributors here would be enough to fill a packed theater even in the smallest of small towns in America. Ronald Reagan, former president of the United States, but before that, former actor of stage and screen. Maureen O'Hara, Edith Head, renowned costume designer. Humphrey Bogart, Shirley Temple Agar, Bert Lancaster the most modern of all the contributors in here. Loretta Young, Johnny Weissmuller. For those who don't know, he was the original Tarzan before it was a twinkle in Disney's eye. Walt Disney, Joan Bennett, Victor Fleming, Dana Andrews, and Joan Crawford, among many others. For the purposes of this review, I'm going to focus on the big wins behind the scenes. First off, Edith Head, renowned costume designer. Her last known work was for Steve Martin's very own film noir parody. Hold that line. Edith Head, famous Paramount designer, tells you the study line and then you will make the best for your appearance. This three page essay summarizes that it's really important for you to focus on the details of the costume that you were in if Edith Head designed you or if anyone else did. Line being the most important in her case, followed by material, and last of all, trimmings. You know what I believe? The most important lines for you to study in a costume are the lines of your script. That way, you'll put on a good performance, and that costume you're in will have something to stand for. This is the story of a great studio by David Hanna, film critic of the Hollywood Daily Reporter, now just known as the Hollywood Reporter. This is Universal Studios, 
as it looked in 1915. Back then, it was known as Universal International, and definitely was one of the big name lots for big name stars. Tom Mix, Lon Chaney, and Mary Pickford, who brought fame and fortune to Universal in its early days. Thanks in large part to those Universal Monster Flicks. This is the Universal Pictures lot, the main entrance of it, as it does, well, not really today, but back in the uh, 80s. I think that has to be one of my favorite articles in this entire piece because I love learning about the history of a film studio, including one as renowned and as long-lasting as the oldest operating in Hollywood. Well, outside of Hollywood, really. Universal International in Universal City, California. This is For You, New Faces by Michael Curtis. Founding his own independent production company, which relied on the plot and the story of whatever script he brought to the screen, rather than the drawing of big-name talent to fill in theaters across America. He didn't really want his films to be tied to the big star system. He was definitely more story-driven than star-driven. You gotta admire him for that. This is Walt Disney's Music is the Mother of Fantasy. How indelible the ties between a great score and a great motion picture are, whether they be animated in Disney's case or live action. I'm surprised, however, that uh, this article does not mention at all the Sherman brothers, Richard and Robert Sherman. You can look here, they don't mention it at all. He doesn't mention it. Walt Disney identified as a man. I wonder how the Hollywood of 1940s and 50s would react to the non-binary terms. I imagine they'd be all aghast. Finally, Choosing the World's Most Beautiful Girls by Errol Kell. If you don't know, he was one of the most famed owners and operators of a series of Dinner and the Show theaters. Dinner right here and the show on the main stage. Where you were treated to a five star dinner and drink. And of course, treated to an equally five star elaborate song and dance number, one of many, by a bunch of beautiful women on stage who all lived up to the glitz and glamour of the time yet still conducted themselves with grace and class. That's one of Elle's most important classifications for choosing, as she says, one of the world's most beautiful women to represent his name, his brand, his company. If you want to know his uh, aesthetic characteristics for his ideal girl, those statistics are found right here. Are they your ideal girl statistics? Or do yours differ? Let me know. I should say that Hollywood in the 1940s and 50s for that matter was in a time where the motion picture production code was the letter of the law in the industry. Where if you walked on the lots, Universal, 2050 Fox, Paramount, Disney, Columbia, wherever, you had to conduct yourself with grace, class, and dignity so that you can live all the glitz and glamour of the time. Under no circumstances, and at no time, could you ever approach a star for an autograph or a photo. Heck, if you worked for Columbia under the presidency of Harry Cohn, doing such offenses, quote-unquote, would be grounds for immediate dismissal, termination. In other words, it could get you, as we like to say nowadays, cancelled on the spot. Yet, above all else, this is one of the more charming eras of America as we know it. Hollywood itself was really just a small community looking to make a big name for itself. This is Films of the Future, by the way. This is one of many photo-based uh, selections and features that you'll be finding here. All black and white photography in these sections with captions underneath so you know which one is which and what scene these pictures are depicting. Some black and white, I mean all black and white, but some are behind the scenes, some from the films themselves as they were shot, and all of them identifiably charming. If you own this book, I think you have a few favorites that you might want to tell me in the comments and I would love to hear them. 
as far as the photographs themselves as a whole, it's a mixture of black and white and color photography. And as far as the color photography goes, well, they're really just portraits of the stars of the day. Like these two. Now I know, I'm the last person who should be reviewing a, a book like this, or any one of the three books you'll be seeing here, because I wasn't born in this era. I was not even a twinkle in my mother's eye, who was not even a twinkle in my grandmother's eye. But that does not mean that I do not have a fondness for the Hollywood of yesteryear. What is the mission of TSR? It is to bring Hollywood home on a budget. And that applies to every era we come upon at any thrift store here in New Jersey or anywhere else. It would have been a disservice not to buy this because this really is not just a charming piece of yesteryear, but really a charming piece of timeless Americana pie. <laughs> a charming slice of Americana pie that even Don McLean would go nuts over. And, yes, like pie, it is fattening. But it fattens your heart a great deal, as well as your mind. With Tales from Yesteryear, in a book that truly represents shop talk at its finest. I gotta say, given its year of publication, again, 1980, this is the closest anyone's ever gonna get to chatting it up with the stars of the day, the stars and the stylists who truly made the spotlight shine a little bit brighter and move a little bit more, I don't know, professionally choreographed. In summary, you people in the dark won't feel so in the dark anymore about revisiting one of the truly golden eras of Hollywood. World clips of any kind in any era are incomplete without something to munch on. So let us now uncover some lost recipes of legendary Hollywood haunts that were staples for the stars and starlets and those that covered them in one of the truly golden eras of Hollywood. So without further ado, let us do Hollywood Do Draw. It's on me. We start in the Coconut Grove. The longest running restaurant of all the 18 restaurants presented in this cookbook, which also doubles as quite a history book. In business for 68 years, 1921 to 1989. Some of the regulars at the Coconut Grove were the it couple of comedy back in the day. Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball, back in the days where I Loved Lucy ruled the airwaves on one of only three channels that you got at the time. Hollywood loyalty such as Charlie Chaplin, Carol Lombard, Claudette Colbert, Lionel Barrymore, James Cagney, Jack Betty, and Dorothy Lamore, also Fanny Bryce, W.C. Fields, Eddie Cantor, Nat King Cole, Tony Martin, Judy Garland, Eddie Fisher, and Lena Horn were all regulars at the Coconut Grove in its heyday. You have here California Oyster St. James and St. James Butter, and raw oysters with cocktail sauce on the white. Right. Two different types of oyster recipes, Something for everyone to snack on, and from the looks of things, ingredients and instruction wise, pretty easy to whip together. Even though this book was published in 1993 by Angel City Press. While there are no recipe photographs to speak of whatsoever, there's more than enough black and white photography of the restaurants themselves, the interiors, the exteriors, and of course, the royalty regulars that will definitely satiate your appetite for Hollywood history. They also have here California Figs Romanoff and Coconut Grove Cocktail. Next up is that ever so famous Brown Derby in business from 1926 to 1985. See if you can spot Gracie Allen and George Burns, another it couple of comedy right here in this photograph. Hmm, I think they're right here. If the camera can unblur. Yep, there you go. Are they right there? You let me know. Recipes from the Brown Derby include the original California Cobb Salad and the Brown Derby Old Fashioned French Dressing. We also have pan fried corned beef hash and grapefruit cake, along with a cream cheese frosting to smear on that cake. This is a photograph of one of the original 
Brown Derby for Swats. What can I tell you about the Gervis Brown Derby? You know good food when you taste it. You know low prices when you see them, don't you? I don't know how they do it, but they do it. I don't know how they do it, but they do it. <laughs> I don't know how they do it, but they do it. Brown Derby does it with broiled Boston scraw, just three ninety-five. It serves sizzling with a fabulous super salad table, choice of potato and French Italian bread. Some remnants of the Brown Derby restaurant can be found at Walt Disney World, and of course MGM Studios Tours in Orlando, Florida. Oh wait, MGM Studios Tours are long gone at Walt Disney Resort in Orlando, which is a shame, really. A lion and a mouse really cannot get along sometimes. This is Swab's Pharmacy, in business from 1935 to 1988. Contrary to popular opinion, this is not where Lana Turner, aka Judy Turner, was discovered. She was actually found at the Top Hat Soda Shop in 1935, a few miles away. So for all those who've ever lost a Hollywood trivia game getting that one question wrong on where Lana Turner first made her mark in the business, at least you can wash down your souls with some old-fashioned, homemade chocolate ice cream soda. Back then, being called a soda truck meant something kind of cool. That is, if you defied the expectations of that name and actually acted like a friend towards your customers and not actually a jerk. Next up, a visit to the players. This is for the Big Reds behind the scenes. The Big Reds behind the screen usually mingle from time to time. Orson Welles and Preston Sturgis among them. Recipes from the players restaurant include, well, three cocktails. Sidecar, Wild Boy, and the Jack Woes. Now you really wish there were some recipe photographs in here, huh? And finally, La Rue. In the 50s, there are plenty of reasons to eat at La Rue, but Betty Goodwin can list only two of them for purposes of time. The food was considered to be among the city's finest, and you might get a mention in The Hollywood Reporter, one of the industry's trade journals. In fact, Hollywood Reporter founder William R. Billy Wilkinson, who owned the restaurant, kept vigil there at table number one and freely plugged the stellar goings on in his paper. Pictured here dining at La Rue are Peter Lorre, John Garfield, Humphrey Bogart, and Lauren Bacall. We have here Tornado's La Rue and Madeira sauce. So, this is a steak dish that you'll definitely want to splurge for. With that in mind, I should say that some of the ingredients for some of the recipes in here might have been common back then, and of course in the 90s for that matter, but they might not be so common now, so this is one of those cookbooks that will have you looking a bit farther beyond your regular grocery store. Even if they were common back then in those two eras, the 40s and the 90s. But on the whole, the recipes sound pretty good to whip up, if being quick and easy can be a subjective term by your taste. And of course, the photography in here, all black and white, definitely satiates your appetite for some edible Hollywood history. There is no retail price in here, but then again, that's so much the better because you know, this is one of those hard to find pieces. And me finding it for $2.49? pretty darn good. Hey, it's gotta be good if it sounds French. Hollywood, you draw. That's French for Hollywood of the day. Hey, it's gotta sound French, right? Hollywood, you draw. I don't know, I might have to uh, look that up. So I'm gonna go do some homework as to how to pronounce that and the origin of the term, you draw, while sipping on some chocolate ice cream soda. Homemade. And why? Because I assure you, Betty Goodwin has done her homework, and no matter how you pronounce this, I think you can all agree that this translates to a delicious blast from the past. It's now time for the book and the moment we've all, well, mostly I've been waiting for. Life in the Fabulous 50s from Reminisce Magazine. 
the fans, photos, and the fun. Just like the previous book, Hollywood Do Draw, there is no retail price to be found for this either. But you know what? Fine by me. This does not look like it needed a dust jacket, and really it's one of those collector's pieces that's just way too hard to put a price on. Especially in terms of your enjoyment of said collector's piece, and you're about to see why. Naturally, because we are TSR, we start with Chapter 4. Pop! The music, the movies, the TV and radio shows of the day. And anytime you start a review off with Elvis the Pelvis, you know to expect the unexpected in here. It's also a video and a book that Amy Grandpa was the soul would automatically detest. So, a fair warning, heavenward, there's going to be a lot of mentions of Elvis in here. Oh God, I'll tear that motherfucking shit up. I'm not gonna tell you where it is. Where's... But before all that, we start off behind the scenes with Lucy Ball, or Lucille Ball. A young boy enjoys a rare bird's eye view of the I Love Lucy set and witnesses television history in the making. This is truly an expert article regarding the behind the scenes hijinks of I Love Lucy. Disciplined, controlled hijinks and craftsmanship all coming together to make one of the most beloved and timeless comedies of any era. This is by Greg Oppenheimer of Santa Monica, California, the son of one of the main head writers of I Love Lucy, Jess Oppenheimer. This is the set of I Love Lucy from the General Surface Studios, aka the Desilu Studios, from the bleachers, from the studio audience seating. Here we have three Mitchell cameras back in the day. They look like solid physical 3D blueprints for how Panavision cameras look uh, for a good chunk of time. I wouldn't say now, because Panavision cameras have evolved over the years, but those look like blueprints for Panavision cameras being used in film sitcoms. Not taped, but filmed. Processed in film. Get that? It's a two-page article in here. By the way, there are plenty of journal entries in here where you can actually write down some of your favorite of these TV stars, or other favorite moments, favorite fads, Music, movie, TV, uh, radio, fashion, favorite moments at home, vacations. You can write down any one of those in one of many journal entries like this one spread throughout this book. You'll also get quite a lesson on uh, vernacular back in the day. The slang terms of the 50s. Like this one. And this one is going to be one real big tickle for you. In other words, really funny to witness and to read, and to picture walk throughout, but also a real hot hugger. That's my little slang time. I don't know if it existed back then, for a hot warming experience. Good nights with Uncle Milty, my date with Marilyn, from one of the old servicemen, that would be Robert <clears throat> Sahoski of Tarzana, California. He, like many other servicemen, had the biggest limerence. If that one ever existed, I don't know. I learned that one from... You guessed it! AKA Cross on Marilyn Monroe. The woman that every serviceman wanted to meet and date. And the one that Robert Zaholsky got the closest to dating. <laughs> this chapter in here represents all of the Hollywood of the era, truly. It also represents a good number of first-hand accounts of people either watching these stars on the stage and screen, developing a fondness for them, or actually having the unique honor and unexpected good fortune of meeting them in person. Whether at meet and greets which weren't that common back in the day, or for the most part, just by chance. By rare happenstance. By rare circumstance. By the way, if you ever met Frank Sinatra back in the day, I would have felt sorry for you because I've heard horror stories about him rebuffing his fans in various aggravatingly rude ways. Nevertheless, we move on to Isn't It Romantic Chapter 6. In the 1950s, pitching rule was different than it is today. Way, way, way different. But one thing's the same. Guys try to impress the object of their desire with a B-N-O. Big night out. 
as these are some of the big nights out. Some of them actually seeing the fates of couples across America over the years. Like this one. The weekend wedding of Arrow and Marilyn Curtis. Marilyn being the contributor for this article. In Las Vegas, Sin City. At the Little Church of the West, specifically. This sidebar here, Price of Love in the 1950s, tabulates all the components necessary to get married back in the day. Now, this was in Las Vegas, at the Little Church of the West, again right over here, so prices might have varied from coast to coast back in the 50s. But, for the Curtis's wedding tab, $87 in total. 25 bucks for the chapel and the wedding dress, 14 bucks for the bridal bouquet, corsages and boutonnieres, $10 for wedding photos, $8 for a one night stay at the Hotel Last Frontier, and a $5 marriage license. You compare the price of $87, no matter how expensive it might sound to you now, to the prices of weddings today, and I'm not just talking for weddings of the stars of today, I gotta tell you, that is a real bargain no matter how you look at it. Especially if you were dining with Duke Ellington and his orchestra calling you on stage to serenade you with I Love You Truly, which became their song. This was at the Flamingo Room, by the way. These are Flamingo Room menus. Now that's a weekend wedding. Continuing on, this is Seeing Stars. Five stars that got men and women's pulses racing. For the men, obviously, Marilyn Monroe, and also Elizabeth Taylor. For the women, James Dean, Marlon Brando, and obviously, Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll. Again, Angry Grandpa, I'm sorry. We caught in a trap. We can't walk out. You know, life in the 50s was not complete without Elvis the Belvis. Here's some 50s dating for dummies etiquette, for guys and for girls. And a space where you can write down your own best and worst date ever. For guys, I hate the no kissing on the first date rule, but then again, America of the 50s didn't have a Me Too movement. We do today, so uh, best to uh, adhere to that rule now. No kissing on the first date. Oh, and leaving the corsage in the fridge on prom night? Well, if you bought a fake corsage, best to leave that in the fridge. If it's a real flower, nah, keep it out. Or keep it in water until it's time. These are the love songs of the 50s, whether making out or making up. These are the ballads that made us weak in the knees. And I'll sing a few of the titles and try to conduct them. <clears throat> love me tender, love me true. I only have eyes for you on the street where you live since I don't have you. Tonight you belong to me. Jumping to Willikers. I never thought I had it in me. Maybe I should try it out for a uh, cocktail bed during, I don't know, cocktail hour at one of the fancy fancy bars in New York City. Or maybe a big band ensemble. Back then it was called a big band orchestra. Or maybe I should not. Because if I ever did and I drew this reaction from just one person in the audience, good or bad, I still would not understand what that reaction would mean. I wouldn't know, and frankly, I wouldn't care because I don't sing. Although I did do a pretty good job there, didn't I? Oh well. Moving on to a first kiss to close out this article. Bruce Thompson of Waukesha, Wisconsin, shares this photograph of his son, Steve, enjoying his first kiss with the girl next door in 1954. It just goes to show that young love can't be fenced in. Although nowadays, it is. And will probably be permanently because of, yes, the coronavirus. So best to learn some etiquette if you want to stay healthy. Please. This is the holidays and celebrations section. If you dined at the Hotel Claremont 
in Berkeley, California on New Year's Eve, like Jane Grimm of San Rafael, California, this is what you would be looking forward to. A fine evening of five-star dinner and drinks, and of course, we're not dancing to the throbbing, aggravatingly pulsating sounds of those modern-day EDM club beats. No, we're swing dancing, or doing the twist, doing some form of disciplined, controlled, yet fun, happy-go-lucky dance with the sweeting sounds of a big band ensemble, specifically Jack Fina and his orchestra, playing every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at the Hotel Claremont. Now, since school will be back in session pretty soon, I thought we'd take this time to introduce you to another chapter called School's In, and actually take a little detour back to school a little bit earlier than scheduled. Woo! Yeah, I know, I know. Going back to school, especially when it's not September just yet, might sound terrible to you. But hey, for the most part, we're going to be highlighting fun after-school activities when the bell rang and students cheered the end of another school day. So, try to relax and look back upon your very own school years if you were one of the baby boomers of the era with kindred fondness and not aggravation. Savvy? All right. I love this chapter here because it connects me to a Family Guy episode. Well, at least in name only. Let's go to the hop. That would be the Hickory Hop. That's by K. Dunn of Fillmore, California. And the Hickory Hop here was located in Pico, California. That's outside of East LA. You see these black and white photographs here from the Hickory Hop? inside and out and of course the menu this was a traditional hop that served traditional diner fare all sorts of delicious homemade american treats and of course serving up tunes to go along with those treats everybody diving safely and wholesomely in the 90s diving was known as something else but then again hey it doesn't matter if you died in the 50s or in the 90s. It was something that everybody should have done at least once in their life for the person that they jacketed with, aka in 1950s slain, going steady. All this for nuggets, loose change. Well, not really loose change for me, but hey, 25% off the price of $3.99 is nothing to sneeze at. Especially we got a cool looking cover photograph of the one and only Mel's Drive-In. Immortalized in George Lucas' American Graffiti. High school discoveries. Discovering the joys and the sorrows of boys. At a very tender age. And taking those boys, if you were lucky, to Larry's Ice Cream Store. That's in Pasadena, California, and we have a fond remembrance of that ice cream shop by Margie Roulette Romero. No relation to my right hand man, David, of Altadena, California. At the drive-in? Yes, the seat at the drive-in by Marvin Hassan of Boise, Idaho. Trying to cheat the system and failing, but not getting in trouble for it because there was a Wednesday night special. Packing a few people into the trunk of a car or hiding them uh, under the, the seats, if that's even possible, only to find out that they were only charging a dollar per person. Yeah. I'd hate to feel those cramps in the morning. Especially if Elvis was on the big screen. Speaking of drive ins, we close with a fond remembrance of them. Drive ins were a great night out. Good times for the family. 
from Catherine McGoggy of Denver, Colorado. An embarrassing collapsy move. Disaster in the dark. Three little words. And a whole lot of fun remembers this of a drive in that you really can't pack into too many words. By the way, those three little words, according to Lorraine Ranieri of Mantua, New Jersey, I love you. Nowadays, the best way to show that crust of yours that you are truly in love with them is to sit inside a movie theater auditorium. There are two little drive ins today in the US and only one that stands in New Jersey. The birthplace of the drive-in theater. And that would be the movie move. Put your arm around the shoulders of the crust of the day. Or whoever it was that you were trying to seduce in the most wholesome and graceful way possible. Mom? Just like Hollywood in the 1940s, this has a mixture of black and white and color photography. But however, this is predominantly color photography. Yes, you see seeing all this in black and white, but I tell you, if you buy this, or if you have this already, it's mostly color photography. And the graphics in here, well, they're definitely colorful. They vary in design. I mean, this is just a colorful book to read. And I spent too much time uh, going over the highlights in here, which I think are noteworthy. So you know what? I'll just say this in closing. This is truly marquee quality, and what I mean by that is this. Like the theater marquee, it shines. It stands tall, wrapped, upright, and at attention. And yet it sits comfortable, which is exactly how this book is going to make you feel. Comfortable, content, life in the fabulous 50s deserves its name. It is truly a fabulous, timeless piece of the past that you will reminisce about with great fondness for a very long time to come. By the way, speaking of drive-ins and Reminisce Magazine, the cover here of Life in the Fabulous 50s reminds me of two other reviews which I will link below. First, the previous Reminisce Magazine book I purchased and reviewed, That's Entertainment. It's basically chapter 4, Pop, Expanded. Reliving the magic of iconic movies, television, radio, and more. I will also link below the American Drive-In Movie Theater. That book encapsulates the fun history and the lore of one of America's most cherished pastimes and leisure time. That book is so good, I did a two-part video on it for Odyssey to the Oscars. That's my annual Academy Awards themed series of reviews I do here at TSR. And finally, if you want to recapture the past of the glory days of the internet, the dot-com boom, check out Internet Archive. It's a site by Brewster Kale, which turned 25 this year. That's right, a quarter of a century of recapturing the past of the internet. All those links will be in the description below. Just click show more, and I promise you, you'll have a ball. But for now, before the curtain comes down on this review, it's time to rank all three of these books. As you know, a maximum of five claps to be awarded, and that maximum score is rightfully awarded to Life in the Fabulous 50s. All things considered, it's just pizza perfect. As for Hollywood in the 1940s and Hollywood de Jour, they're not gonna get five claps because they both have minor deficiencies. No recipe photographs in Hollywood de Jour, and as for Hollywood in the 1940s, you think for a moment that either Ivy Crane Wilson or Liz Smith could have put something in the back here. Some photographs or a short summary, one of the two or both, to, I don't know, tease you for what you were going to get in here if you bought this at the time. They did not. It's just completely blue and blank. And I don't know about you, but that makes me feel a little bit blue. Both books will share a rating of four and a half out of five claps for a grand impressive total of 14 and a half out of 15, which proves you are never too young to feel old. <laughs> really all kidding aside, as Ed Sullivan would say, all three of these books, no matter how old you are, will definitely make you the toast of the town, if not the apple of your grandparents or great uncle or great great Amps I. Whatever, whoever, all three of these books are truly golden. Okay, golden and silver, but still. 
They'll make you feel nostalgic for the past, and who among us would not like to take a trip back in time to an era where there was no such thing as COVID-19 above all else. Never has going back in time to revisit the golden era of Hollywood, or the golden age of Hollywood, felt more inexpensive, or above all, way more fun. However, our collective admiration of all things golden age of Hollywood should not end with these books, or any other books like these. If you have any elders in your family that you know of and are close with or otherwise, sit down with them. Ask them about the days when they were young. Chances are they have a wealth of stories so nostalgic and so riveting that they too can fill up books quite like these someday. And it will hock it all of us back to a time where, quite frankly, the world, not just Hollywood, but Mother Earth, felt and looked a little more... ...colorful. It's our chance to keep the good old days alive. Thank you for joining us. That is the Thrift Store Rundown, but the Hollywood home on a budget anytime. And I truly mean any time. Until next time, you know how this story ends. I'll catch you, as always, on the thrift side. This is where your life